All righty. Good morning. Good morning. How, how is everybody? <laughs> Sweet. Dude, it's been a really nice weekend. Like, the sun's been out. I think today, what, is it cloudy right now or is it still sunny? It's beautiful, it's beautiful regardless, right? <laughs> Glory to God. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Before we start, uh, yeah, as always, let us pray. Um, every time we wake up in the morning, let us pray. Every time we start anything, let us pray. Um, it's to always be in prayer in the meditation of the word of God is, uh, is what we shall do. So thank you guys so much for being here. Um, and yeah, let us, let us just bow our heads and pray. Thank you, God, so much for letting us be here, Lord. Um, to be able to learn uh, so much more about you today, God, is, is what we are asking for, God. And um, for, for you to um, work in our lives, Father, um, for you to always be with us and uh, allow us to be with you as well, God. Um, you have done so much for us in this world, God, and uh, for, for what you've done for us on the cross, God, for shedding the blood uh, for us, Father, to, um, to cleanse us of our sins, God. So thank you so much for that, Father, and may, it, may us know that you've done that to us, God for us, God, so that we may know you, Father, and I just pray that the people that do not know you, God, uh, know you today, God, and if not tomorrow, God, but soon, let them know that you are truly the Lord and King of our lives, Father, that you came to this earth, um, and you definitely was were a man, God, and you were God at the same time, Father, um, that you were like us, Father, um, and Lord, may we know who you truly are, God, and uh, let us let us be uh, your children, Father. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, just a few announcements. Uh, this week is Communion Sunday, um, so please pray and, and look into that. Um, next week, or uh, actually. Um, Next week will be the church potluck. Also, it'll be Father's Day, so make sure to invite your uh, uh, husbands, fathers, or anyone who uh, would like to attend. Just invite them over to enjoy the potluck. Also, um, every Wednesday, we have a church uh, Bible study coming on. Uh, we encourage you to come down or to join us on Facebook. That's starting at 7 p.m. every Wednesday. Also, um, every Saturday, currently, uh, during the spring and possibly into the summer, we're having uh, yard work uh, done here, um, starting at 9 a.m. on Saturdays. Uh, if you'd like to come down and help clear up some of the yard or some of the grounds, uh, they do weed eating and cleaning up. So if you're interested in that, we encourage you to come down and just help out with the church. Um, and with that, I just ask everyone to greet one another and say hello. Thank you. Please stand up for worship. <laughs> yeah, let's stretch our legs. You ready? Go ahead. Jesus, who sits on the throne, Jesus, the Lamb of God. 
we continue to the next song, let us prepare ourselves for communion. For the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the wine. take, uh, you can be seated, Vanessa, as soon as we get rid of the home there. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. We take communion once a month here. We don't take it every Sunday. We don't want it to become common. We don't want to, to lose its uh, dynamic. The, what Jesus wanted us to do was remember him in it and his sacrifice for us. In Luke 22, he says, with fervent desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you. He's talking to his disciples before I suffer. And he, he, he knew that his time had come and this was the last Passover he would s serve with them. He who would become the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And he passed the cup around and there were many cups there during the Passover meal, and they all drink of it. He said, you know, I'm not going to drink of this cup, this fruit of vine, until I drink it anew with you in the kingdom. And then afterwards, he took the cup, or he took the, the bread, 
the um, bread without leaven. And he broke it and said, this is my body that is broken for you. And he said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So when we take the bread, we're taking a symbol of the Lord's body that he's, that was broken for us and during the scourging, during the crucifixion. He suffered for us. And like Peter said, by his stripes, we've been healed. And so he suffered for us to take our suffering upon himself. So as we take the bread, we remember that Jesus Christ did a great thing for us in suffering for us. And by his stripes, we are healed. Let's take the bread. Then he took the cup and he said to drink it because this said, he said, this is the blood of the new covenant or the new covenant in my blood. And it's representing his spilled blood on the cross, his death for us. And we know he's resurrected, but he said, don't forget. Don't forget I died for you is what he wants us to know. This, So we take this once a month, once a month so we can remember the tremendous sacrifice that our Lord gave, who is sinless, but he died for all sinners so that we can be saved. So as we take the cup, remember his sacrifice. Let's partake. As we continue to praise God, let us stay seated for the next song.
pray there is no mediator, no individual that holds the key to you, God. Yes, God. Sing it together. as we hear the message today, God, that you prepared for us, Father. I pray that it glorifies your kingdom, God. That it is fruit to our soul, God. It is bread to our soul. It is food to our soul, God. Let it replenish us, Father. As we serve you. If there's anything else in our hearts, God, that we need to pray for, God, sing one more time. Everybody said, Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen and amen. Let me log into my Bible here and we'll begin the study. We're going to be in uh, Luke chapter 15. Verses 11 through 32 today. The story of the prodigal son. You say, oh, we've heard this one. We know this one. Don't check out yet. Maybe something we haven't learned yet. Something about it. Luke 15, 11. Oh, there we are. Let's pray as we open God's word. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all that you do for us, Lord, the things that are there for us, for our learning, Father, so for our edification so that we can grow. We pray today, Lord, this morning, that you be here, Lord, that your spirit be our teacher, our ears be open to what your spirit has to say to the church today. 
Lord, that we would take these things, hide them in our heart, Lord, and carry them on through our lives, Lord. And we appreciate and thank you for your word and your spirit to give us understanding, your love, Lord, that it was sent with. And we ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the story of the prodigal son, it's a parable told by Jesus, it's only mentioned in Luke here, but it's uh, listed as probably the most popular short story of all time in those that gauge short stories. And it's also mentioned a few times by even uh, Shakespeare in his writings. And so it's a, a, an interesting story. It has a lot of prominence. And of course, Jesus is talking to um, the Pharisees and his disciples, those who um, were proud of their religion and proud of their um, staying with, uh, their following the Lord. But Jesus is talking about, well, what about those who stray away? What about those who um, fall away? Are they restored? They can be, and they should be. But it's a decision that they have to make. Now, we as Christians have a new nature from God. When we're born again, we receive the Holy Spirit and we receive a new nature. We receive that nature of the Spirit, but we're still plagued, I would say, plagued with our, these bodies of flesh. And they still have their desires, but we just now have a power over them because of the Holy Spirit be, being born again uh, through Jesus Christ. And so we have a struggle. And we have a choice, a daily choice, almost moment by moment choice, where we need to decide what to do with things that our flesh would like, or thinks it would like, against the things that the spirit desires. And the two, Paul says, they're contrary to one another. There's always, there's always that enmity, that war going on. And so we... Uh, have to make the choices, and sometimes those choices uh, we, we let slip. Sometimes there, there are those among us who fall away. We call them backsliders, right? We call them those who have uh, given up the, the fight, those who have uh, succumbed to what the desires of their flesh are and the seeing the things in the world, deciding the grass is greener on the other side, and let's go check it out, it can't be really that bad. And so they, they kind of uh, loosen up and do that. So we're talking about a uh, segment of Christians that do that. Now, we in this, this passage has been used as an evangelical text, as declaring God's love, which it does, but it's really about uh, falling away and, and being restored. And Jesus spoke this parable. And so in verse 11, it says, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And so in those first two verses is something as astonishing, because this younger son um, went to his father, and his father seems to have a, a nice house, an estate, has servants, and he told his father, he said, I want my inheritance now. I don't want to wait till you die. That's like too far in the future for me. I want my inheritance now, so divide unto me, give me the portion that, of goods that falls to me, and you know, if my son or daughter came to me and said, I want my inheritance now, sell the house, give me whatever. I would say, no. <laughs> Get a job, provide for yourself, and, you know, learn some responsibility. And, uh, you know, when I die, we'll talk about it. But, <laughs> but that's not the story here. The story here is uh, the father actually did it which is amazing. And if you're looking in, this, uh, in, in this analogy of this parable that, that we're speaking of God the Father, 
you know, and those who are his sons and those who are his children and their choices they're making, going to him and, and, and disrespecting his father so greatly uh, and his father doing it. That's amazing that he would do that, but it, it helps the story. And um, so his father did it. In verse 13, not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country, and there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Prodigal just means wasteful. So he wasted his possessions being wasteful. And so his living was wasteful. Proverbs 2021 20, says, An inheritance gained hastily at the beginning will not be blessed at the end. Wisdom. And uh, interesting that the father at this point didn't plead with his son or chase after him. Say, please don't go. Please don't do this. He, he, and all this, the father just seemed to just be compliant with what he his son's choices were. And sometimes we have to let our children, as they are of age appropriate, I should say, as they are of age, uh, suffer the effects of their own choices. We, we have to let them go. And that's, that's hard to do. We, we, my wife says that when they come into their teenagers, we all... Awesome be, often becomes their cheerleader or their coaches. You know, we're, we're no longer the great disciplinarian we were when they were five, you know. Now they're making choices, and we want them to make choices. We hope they make choices based upon what we've taught them and trained them up to at that time, but sometimes they don't. And then they have to suffer those uh, repercussions so that they can learn themselves that it was their choice to go this way and their choice that brought the problems upon them and just be there with that, them through those years where they're making those choices and, and help them out if we can, but not taking away the responsibility from them so that they can understand the, re, the uh, responsibility of making choices themselves. Now, this young man said, Dad, I want my inheritance now. Give it to me. And his dad just did it. Now, he had two sons, and in that uh, culture, in, in the Old Testament, they would, um, the older son always got a double portion. So there was, it would be about a third of his father's possessions or value that he would have given his younger son. But he didn't chase after him. He said, you know, or try to discourage him. He said, don't do this. And when he left, he said, don't go away, stay home, you know. And sometimes we, we want to coddle our kids, even in their wrong choices. But uh, sometimes we have to commit them to the Lord, too, especially when they're older in their walk. And, and we know that as Christians, we, like I said, we have choices to make, and sometimes we make wrong choices. And it becomes a trial for us, and God intends it to be so, so that we learn to make right choices. They, one person said, how do I... Learn to make good choices well by, lear by learning from making wrong choices. And uh, we all have to learn. We all have to grow up. This young man was very disrespectful to his dad. But his dad went along with it. And it says they journeyed to a far country. He didn't want to stay at home. He was done with home, so done with being home. And some Christians are done with church. They're done with uh, the fellowship. They're done with you know what they could perceive as rules and and uh, the call of the flesh and the world is, is like a siren song. They're going to be wrecked on the rocks, but they're drawn to it. And, uh, you know, that it's got to be their choice to follow Jesus Christ, having received him, to follow him still. And so he spent it all, all this inheritance on Prodigal living, wasteful living. Verse 14, but when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And so, not only did he run out of money, I don't know how quickly he ran out of money, probably not too long a time he ran out of money, on top of that, the place where he decided to go and be away from his father, away from his family, uh, there was a famine there. 
And uh, it says in Proverbs 27, 8, it says, like a bird that wanders from its nest, so is man, a man who wanders from his place. We all have a place, you know. And a bird wandering from his nest, in other words, not in the right place. Ever been in the wrong place at the wrong time, you know, by our choices, you know? Ever, somebody ever ask you, what are you doing here? <laughs> what are you doing doing this, you know? Okay, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not supposed to be here. I've got to be someplace else. So, well, he hadn't come to that realization yet. And uh, there arose a famine in the land. He was not only out of money, but he... He went and joined himself, or the literal, literally the word say, glued himself to a certain uh, citizen of that country. In other words, not going back to where he belongs, but just affirming or confirming his choice to be in this country, and he joins himself to a citizen of that country. And the citizen really didn't have anything for him to do, you know, wasn't going to provide for him, and, and he sent him to feed his herd of swine. And uh, he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods from the, that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. No one gave him anything. And now, his father gave him everything. But in that country, no one gave. No one gave anything. And that's the world, you know. Christian going to the world. What are you going to get from the world? Jesus Christ has given you all. You're not going to get, even, no matter how firm you join yourself to the world, you're going to lack. You're not going to have enough. Now, I, when I was a young, I'll, I'll share my testimony with you if uh, Adrian can get it up on the screen. And uh, when, when I was young, I received Jesus Christ. Uh, can you read that? There's my testimony, 1967. <laughs> my wife found that in our papers. <laughs> it says, I go to chapel. I go to chapel because I believe in Christ the Lord. I spelled chapel wrong, okay. <laughs> my wife told me that. But that's my testimony. <laughs> and uh, I was, I, that's enough, Adrian, okay. <laughs> but as a child, I loved the Lord. I did. I, I came to the Lord at a very young age. When I was five, I told my grandmother, I said, I'm going to be a preacher someday. Why did I say that at five? I don't know. I forgot about it. When my grandmother was very old and we went to see her in the you know, convalescent home. She, we, uh, I asked her, do you know me, Grandma? Do you remember me? She said, yeah, you're my little preacher boy. Okay. <laughs> so that's my testimony. I, I knew the Lord. But then high school and teenage years happened, and, and uh, I, I heard the, the call of the world, you know. And I, and I didn't go to church, and I didn't follow the Lord, although it was there in me the things that I did during my teen years up into late teens and uh, the way I, the choices I made, I knew they were wrong. I knew they were wrong. But I went that way anyway and uh, seeking to fulfill something that I really, you know, thought I wanted, thought I needed. Seeking it in the world, seeking it among worldly friends and worldly situations. And it didn't turn out well. But, um, you know, it, it wasn't until, you know, I was married and, and things weren't going well in that either. You know, I, I got it all wrong because I wasn't following the Lord. I wasn't listening to the Lord. I was doing my own thing. And I married a beautiful young woman who I'm still married to 47 years later. And, uh, but uh, it just didn't seem right. And I wasn't pleasing her and, and I wasn't pleasing myself. I wasn't good about anything and it really broke me. I spent all that I had. I, I was in want. I, I wasted it all on wasteful things. And uh, I, I looked for what is the answer and I knew I knew deep what the answer was. I had to go back. I had to go back. So in verse 17, after no one gave him anything, and he would have eaten with the pigs gladly because he had nothing there. The pods, the pods were the carob pods. They, you can eat the beans from the carob pods, but you've got to separate them from the pods, and they make kind of a chocolatey thing 
with him, so he he could sustain himself. But uh, you know, he was going to eat bean pods from carob tree with the pigs. Nah. Verse seventeen. But when he came to himself, oh, something happened. He joined first. He joined himself steadfast to a citizen of that country. Citizen says, you know, go feed my pigs. Eat what you can with the pigs. No one gave him anything. And after a while, he came to himself. Isn't that wonderful? And he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and to spare? And I perish with hunger. Sometimes we need to fill it in our gut before we really get it. And sometimes we need to have that realization. We have to be careful, you know, in our society. We are a, a very compassionate people as a whole in, in the United States, but also we can be guilty of enabling certain behaviors that we're compassionate about people that are homeless, drug addicts, and we want better for them, but are we going to help them come to themselves? and make the right choices are we going to enable them and, and so many social programs you know we will feed them in their homelessness now do they have a choice to be homeless they can be helped we should help them not be homeless but as long as we feed many of them they continue to be homeless because we're enabling them because they don't feel it here they don't feel it in their tummy believe me if you feel it in your stomach you're hungry you're going to do something about it but if somebody just drops off food at your door, what's wrong with the way I live? Or if somebody gives you a clean needle, who's going to help you with your addiction? You know, we have to be careful not to be a, a subpar or an inferior providence for them. We want God to be in their lives. Now, we can give them the gospel. It doesn't mean we can't feed them. I'm not going to give them a clean needle. I'm going to get them in a program that gets them off of that or bring them to the Lord who can get them off of that. You know, and um, we need to be careful that we don't get in God's way of the work that he wants to do in their lives. And, uh, you know, even in the church, we can be responsible for getting in God's way, being a... a an inferior province when God's maybe working in their lives and wants them to come to the place where they're lacking, where they're in want, and they, you know, need to realize they need to come to themselves. And we have to be careful. We have to listen to the Holy Spirit and be work with God, not against him, or not get in between God and what he's doing in somebody's life. We don't want anybody to suffer, but we need to help people to have, you know, make the right choices in the church, and that's through prayer, through the word of God, and helping them out some, but not becoming their providence, not becoming, uh, you know, God to them in providing everything they need. And so it's, it's a fine line. It's a difficult choice, and, and sometimes, you know, you have to, I usually do the what if rule, you know, what if I don't give them anything? I used to get, at, at the church, used to get people calling to want, they want help with the rent. Usually, they, they make the, the church circuit at the end of the month. They call different churches, you know, need help with the rent, need help with the power bill, need help with the water bill, need, you know, and they, and they call. And um, they call with the, you know, want, can you help, can your church help me with the power bill and, and stuff in, in the summer, and I'm thinking, what is the consequences? What if the church doesn't give them money for their power bill? Refrigerator might not work. Lights might not work. It won't freeze in summertime, you know. No, I won't. You need to do what you need to do to provide for yourself. And, you know, you just have to be wise in that way. Now, if they're in, it's wintertime, they're going to freeze. I'm not going to let them freeze, but also going to visit them and help them. I know one church, um, they would give, the first time people came to them and asked for money from the congregation now, 
They would give no questions asked. But the second time they came to ask money, they would say, no, not until you go for some financial counseling, not until we sit down and talk about it and see why you're in this situation and see if we need to continue helping you or you need to do something. You need to come to yourself and change your mind. And so there's that. Now, the, the father did not, like I said, pursue the son coming after him and you know, saying, don't wait, stop, come back. He didn't. He just quietly let him go. And when he had trouble, did he write back home to ask for money? Some, some of our kids might, but uh, he didn't. But the father also didn't go looking for him and say, do you need money? You know, He waited patiently for God to do the work in his heart. And sometimes we have to do that with our children or with other people. We have to let the work be God's. He was hungry, but when he came to himself, he was breaking off from his own selfishness, from his own desires, and looking back to what was there before, realizing he was far worse off there than he was with his father, knowing that even the hired servants of his father's house were taken care of, and he says, I perish with hunger. I'm hungry. And he could remember his father's house, how much better off he was there. He wasn't happy at the time because he wanted to go explore the world. You know, we have, we, we have rules of the house that the kids have to obey once while they're with us. You know, they can make their own choices and live as they want, but as long as they're living in the house, we, we, we don't give them rules to be saved by, rules to that they have to live by to be a good Christian. We have the rules of the house to maintain the order in the house. You won't do this or you won't do that while you're living with us. And, but he didn't like the rules of the house, obviously, and left. But now he's hungry. He's feeling it in his gut. And he wants to go back home because he says, you know, I had a lot of food when I was at fa in my father's house. Now even the servants, his hired servants, have a lot of food, more than they need. You know, in uh, Psalm, verse 84, 10, it says, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. And coming to that realization, just to come back to the family of God, away from the world. Sometimes we have to have the foul taste of the world to know that, to remember the good taste, taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, it's the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance. He wasn't going to come back to rules and regulations. He wasn't going to come back to the law. He was going to come back to the goodness of his father. But he was going to, in a repentive way, um, ask for, forgiveness and not ask to have the same position he had before as a son, even though he was a son. And he said in verse 18, I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer to be worth, worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. That was he's practicing what he's going to say to his father, how he's going to make amends, how he's going to, he's repented now, he wants to go back, how am I going to go back? What am I going to say, you know? And he's not looking to, you know, just saunter back into the house and say, I'm home, Dad, you know, what's for dinner? No, something's changed, something had to change. And he's no longer that, uh, you know, cavalier. He's no longer that, immature he's grown up some and he realizes the situation he's come to himself his own selfish desires are now not uh leading him he he wants that relationship back with his father but he's not going to ask for it he's going to ask to just be a servant you know better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere he knew his even the hired servants had food and he was hungry and these carob pods are just not good for dinner. And so he practicing his speech to his dad, his, his repentance speech, his, his uh, 
supplication to his father. And he says, I'll confess my sin. He says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so that was his, that was his uh, uh, spiel he was going to give to his father to beg his father's forgiveness and just have food. Just be like in his father's house where he wanted to be to return to. And many times uh, Christians, as they backslidden, as we call it, fell, fallen away from the Lord, they have to come to that realization that, no, it's better to follow Jesus. And it's remembering that with the Lord, there's goodness, there's salvation, there's, there's refreshing from the sun and, and uh, to know that they need, know where you need to be. You know, if you're a born again Christian and you begin to make wrong choices, it doesn't happen all overnight. It begins a choice wrong choices, a, a few in, in compiling on until you come to that point where you actually depart from the family of God. But uh, you know in your heart where you need to be. You know where you are not supposed to be. And after a while, the reality will set in and you'll want to come back to the church and you'll come back and, you know, if it's if it's the the trials have worked their their works in you, you won't saunter back into the church and say, hey, I'm a Christian, you know, let, let me in the fellowship. No, you'll come back and you'll say, you know, I've, I've been wrong. I need to come back. I need to repent. I need to seek the Lord and I need prayer. And that's the way to come back. Realizing, coming to yourself, realizing the mistakes you made. And so he arose in verse 20 and came to his father but when he was still a great way off, this is the cool verse, okay? When he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. He was still a long way down the road, but his father saw him. Now, how could his father see him? His father was looking for him, waiting for him, anticipating his return, wanting him to come back. Now, he didn't go pursue him, didn't follow him. He, had to, he knew that God had to do a work in his son's heart and in his life. But when he's looking down the road daily, probably, just to see when he would come back, if he was coming back, he saw him afar off. And he ran to meet his son. Now, that is undignified. That is something that was not done in that culture. The elder was not to run. That was undignified. But uh, in this case, he ran to his son. And there's a song by Benny Hester back in the 80s. Uh, it's, it's called When God Ran. And it's the story of the prodigal son. And our, our grandkids love that song, you know, because it tells the story of uh, him leaving his father and, and uh, wanting to come back. And, and uh, he came back and, and it, it's, it says that, you know, the day I left home, I'd broken his heart. I wondered if it could ever be the same. And then one day I remembered his love for me. And down that dusty road, ahead I could see, it was the only time, the only time I ever saw him run. And, uh, you know, it's the course is when God ran. And that's the beautiful thing about coming back into the family of God. You're a son. You left, but you're still a son or a daughter. And you're still in God's heart. But he's going to let the things of the world work in you to give you a foul taste of the world and realize that they cannot satisfy and knowing that you have to return to the Lord. And when God, when you're coming back to God, he doesn't, he doesn't wait, you know, with a stern look, you know. And in those days, if you, you know, according to the Old Testament, if you had a disrespectful or a, gluttonous son or, a, or an alcoholic son, you could beat them, you know, or you could have them stoned. You brought them to the priest and you said, you know, this son is disobedient, you know, and, 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 and uh, you know, glutton and everything, and they was stoned to death. You know, that was the Old Testament. That was the law. But God is love. Now, that was in the law. That was the discipline of the, of the people of Israel that was given them. But, and this father had, I suppose, that right 
if he wanted to so choose it, but expressing God's love, he saw his son coming up the road a long way off, and he ran and grabbed him and had compassion, fell on his neck and kissed him. I mean, that's just the, the, the coolest verse that when coming back to God, he doesn't wait with a stern, you know, are you repented yet, you know, you know, thou shalt not do this again. And, you know, it's just like, wow, the embrace, the embrace of God. Welcome back. Welcome back. And the son said to him in verse 21, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And he was, this was what he had practiced. You know, I've sinned against heaven and before you and, and, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And, but before he could complete his spiel that he'd practiced, his speech that he was going to give this father to ask to be a servant, the father interrupted him and said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and Put a ring on his hand and, and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and, it, and let us eat and be merry. <laughs> he couldn't get the, I want to just be your servant. He couldn't get there. He was a son. And that's the way his father saw him. No matter what had transpired, his son had come back and he did not change his position. He wasn't going to be allowed to even ask for it. The father said, you know, bring the best robe and put on him, you know, and I don't know what it state his clothes were in, probably not that great, but put the best robe on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. This was just totally honor to him. Bring the fatted calf, you know, and we're going to have the best feast, the best meat at the meal for him and let us eat and be merry for, verse 24, This is my son who was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they begin to be married. He was dead and he's alive again. So when he left his father's house, it was like dying. I mean, his father just felt he lost him, and that was a great loss. I mean, for a son to be so respectful and, and, and go away like that, disrespectful. And... Uh, it was, you know, just like dying to him, and he was lost, but not forever. The Lord's so good. And uh, when he came back, the father just couldn't, he was beside himself. He said, you know, my son was dead. He's alive now. He's lost, and now he's found. And uh, they began to be merry. Just a great party at dad's house, you know and uh, forgiven, restored. Now, he, he had no inheritance left. There was nothing that was going to be left to him now when his father is dead, but he didn't seem to care about that. The father, you know, that was just another thing. His son's come back to him. It's the relationship that he was worried about, you know. We don't want people to come back and obey our rules in the church. We want them to come back to renew that relationship with Jesus Christ and have that joy of the fellowship. And we need to be open to that. And some aren't. Now his older brother. Come to the other brother who's not been mentioned at this point. Now his older brother in verse 25 was in the field and he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked, what, are these, what do these things mean? And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. And But he was angry and would not go in, and he really rent, went into a rant. You know, he, he was just, what? He's killed my brother's back, and he's killed the fatted calf, and he was beside himself, really, with anger. At this happening, he knew his younger brother should get his comeuppance, you know, and shouldn't be, he wasn't going to allow him, you know, this, this can't be, and so he would not go in, no way am I going to party because my dumb brother came back, you know. <laughs> Ever have a dumb brother? I don't know. <laughs> what is it? 
In Proverbs, a friend loves at all times, but a brother is born, born for adversity. So, he said, I'm not going to do it. But he was angry, would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. This, now, the father didn't plead with the younger brother to, you know, not to go or anything like that, but he's, he's now going to intercede on behalf of his younger son to the older son, the one who's been faithful to him, the one who's never left. And he went out and he pleaded with him. Interesting, the heart of God, seeing that love matters the most. That it's, it's the relationship that matters. And Things, circumstances, choices, yes, those can be hurtful, those can be wrong, but you got to overcome that. You know, love covers a multitude of sin. You know, the critical heart doesn't love. And we want to encourage love. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you, never transgressed your commandment at any time, Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. It's like, <laughs> where's my party for being here and being faithful? You know, a little complaint. But as soon as this son of yours, not my brother, <laughs> as soon as this son of yours, you never have that with your wife, you know, and the, and the kids. You know, you come home from work and your wife says, your son. <laughs> You know what your son did, you know. She's not claiming him right now. <laughs> and that's it. This son of yours, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots. Now, harlots wasn't mentioned before. He, was, he just spent his, wasted his, his uh, inheritance with uh, wasteful living. And his, his older brother is accusing him, said he is... Spinning on harlots, you know. He slipped it. We devoured your livelihood with harlots, and you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you're always with me, and all that I have is yours. Just reminding him of his place. Yes, you're always with me. That's a blessing. That's a good thing. That's where you should be, and you made the right choices, and all that I have is yours. Every bit of, of inheritance is left to the older son. The younger son, it's gone. He's not going to get any more inheritance. He's got it. So the father says, all that I have is yours, and that's it. When we come back to the Lord, we come back, you know, as, as paupers, you know, in the spirit, we need the Lord to renew us and to join us again to his family, but those of us who have not strayed, we cast a critical eye on, on the uh, backsliders, and maybe there's a need for that, but when they return, when they come to the Lord, there should be rejoicing. There should be rejoicing. And we shouldn't be judgmental of them. You know what you did, you know. You know who you are. Come back into this fellowship. Son, you've always been with me, and everything I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. This is the right thing to do. Receive him, love him, forgive him, because if you love him, you can forgive him. If you're critical of anybody, there's no forgiveness in criticism. But if you love him, love covers a multitude of sin. Give them a robe, give them a ring, give them sandals. Kill the fatted calf. You know, just rejoice that they've come back into fellowship. That your children have returned to the Lord. And it's going to be better now. And we need to be that kind of church that welcomes the repentant sinner, but also the repentant backslider. We want to have them in the fellowship. We want to let God work in their lives. If they've made the wrong choices, if they're, they're damaging themselves and Christ's reputation, just pray for them that God would work in their lives. If they're truly born again, they will not be comfortable forever in the world. And you just have to wait and let God do his work 
and hopefully that it will be a brief work before they return into him. And welcome them when they return. I, I love the Lord, and I don't want to depart again. I mean, I had my teenage years where I, you know, departed, but I knew in here, I knew. I knew I was wrong. And then when I came to the, myself, I came to the end of myself, I returned to the Lord. And I don't want to go anywhere again. I know where I belong. And so we need to encourage one another and uh, help those who are weak and forgive those who come to us repenting. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, the story of this son that was so rotten, but Lord, you did a work in his heart and he rejoiced at his turning around. And Lord, we pray for those who are away from the church right now, away from their relationship with you, but once knew you, Lord, once knew and had that fellowship, and they still know you. They still know who you are. They still know what's right. But we pray for them, Lord, that they return to you, that they reject the world now, Lord. It has nothing for them. It just wastes them. And there's nothing that anyone will give them in the world that's of value. But Lord, you have everything that they return to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Lord, I do pray for the people that have strayed off the path that follow you on, God. I just pray that they return back to that path to follow you again, God. If they strayed away, God, let them know that you are still there waiting for them. And let us discern that, God, that the people that are lost in this world, that we do not satisfy their flesh, God. But they are given the fruit of life. Not fruit of life, I'm sorry. But the bread of life that you've given us, God. And the blood that you've shed for us as well, God. May them know that their deaths have been forgiven. That they don't need to stray anymore. Let them return. And let us rejoice in that as well. Father, so much for the fellowship that you've given us, God. We are brothers and sisters of you, Father. Let us be accountable for one another and bring each other to you, God, anytime we are distracted from this world, God. And may we do the same for the people that are not following you, God, but still bring them over to you, Father. In your name we pray. Everybody said, Amen.